I'm Vincent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm about to be uh, as sweaty as you are. Great, great news. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a friend of WeShare. That, that's one of my identity. I think that somewhere uh, a paperboard is going to be put and we have a little game for the audience. Oh, it's there. So um, you have about one hour uh, to think about uh, this question. What identity do you think uh, fits you within the next 30 years? Do you consider yourself as a wisherist, as a Parisian, uh, as a Canadian, since we have uh, only Canadian on this talk? Uh, do you consider yourself as a European, and you would be the only one? Do you consider yourself as a Donald Trump fan, because he got badly attacked during the, the talk before me, I was, I was rather shocked. Uh, or do you consider yourself as an Airbnb shareholder since uh, Dylan seems to have uh, some options there. So <laughs> you had a great talk about uh, Dylan, so you got introduced to him and we got uh, joined here by Sonia Miokovic. And as you can hear her name, she comes from Canada as well. <laughs> uh, and as Dylan, you come from, uh, so Dylan, you have a three times uh, background since you're uh, American, Canadian, and Mexican. And Sonia, you're an urbanist. Uh, you're, you're obviously co-funded Wonderlab. And you come from Canada, Serbia, uh, Germany, uh, Poland. Born in, Kuwait. Born in Kuwait. And you work, write, and live in 75 countries. So, <laughs> so how, how do you deal uh, with that? Um, existential crisis, what, what, what would be your identity nowadays? We'll, we'll see if it changes within one hour. <laughs> uh, this is a question I always get asked, obviously. Uh, like, uh, sorry. Thank you. So this is a question I always get asked. So where are you from? And I'm always like, well, do you mean directly? Like, where did I fly from? Or do you mean my cultural heritage? Or do you mean my identity or my sense of belonging? Uh, and I don't really have answers for either of those, so I'm maybe identity less, or part of this uh, increasing global uh, group of people that just feels a little bit more connected nomadically uh, around like-minded people, maybe. And what 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 could make you uh, Canadian except for your passport? Well, when I'm using my passport, when I'm at a border, it's very helpful to have a Canadian passport. Uh, there's been a few times, actually, that I travel with people from other places around the world, and, you know, it's such an issue. Am I going to get the visa? I have to send my, you know, my, my passport, not me, but my friend with an Ecuadorian passport. She has to send it to Bogota to get certification to go to different places, uh, whereas me, sometimes I'll find myself in an immigration line, and I'm like, oh, shit, do I need a visa? Because I'm so used to not needing... Uh, a visa, so kind of the the Canadian passport or the connection to the Canadian identity in some ways makes you feel more fluid or, or allows you structurally to be fluid, which I think hits on a lot of the the points about barrier or sorry boundaries and, and uh, barriers globally. But is there anything that makes you feel Canadian, like when you hear Justin Trudeau uh, delivering a speech or when you watch a hockey game, maybe Tim Hortons? No, <laughs> <laughs> crack coffee, you know. no, no, nothing. Uh, I think... Um, I, 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 I'm going to be rather severe right now. I, I apologize. You have to, to think for the, the back of the audience. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think the the values that I feel identify with most that I feel are Canadian are values around inclusion, uh, multiculturalism. Um, those, those types of values are, are what I feel are Canadian, and I'm proud about that aspect. But in terms of being like patriotic or connected to a physical land or what it represents, I don't have. I, I feel that I don't have that. Donald Trump being president makes me feel very Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> but the pre prime minister before Trudeau, Stephen Harper, was terrible. He was incredibly xenophobic, and Canada became very conservative, and in terms of its policies. So uh, my wife is Mexican, and she wasn't able to come into Canada for my father's funeral as my wife because of how strict they'd made the border. So during that time, when we had Obama and Harper, I kind of associated a little more American. Yeah. So it, it makes me kind of a terrible patriot in some ways because it's a little wishy-washy, but the, the integrity comes from the association with the values and the mm -hmm. principles of the people that I'm around. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when, when you were listening and uh, when you were speaking first, uh, I, I was looking at all the, all the arguments you were giving about why is border obsolete. And 
intellectually I was rather convinced, but I tried to match and, and look at a few figures. Uh, since 1999, since we'd warped one wall, uh, obviously the Berlin one, uh, 50 new walls uh, appeared in the world for, uh, you, do you count in kilometers or in miles? Okay, in, in kilometers is good, good. One, one boundary. Uh, so we had 40,000 Kilo, uh, yeah, 40,000 yeah, 40, uh, 40, kilometers of new walls around the world. That's 50 walls uh, that were mainly built for two reasons. One is uh, preventing terrorism, and uh, the other one is preventing the, the entrance of migrants. So in, 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 in one case, it would be the, the Great Wall with Mexico, uh, and, and in the other one would be what happens right now in, in Hungary, where no migrants um, come in the country every day. So you see that there is all this fear and tension coming in the idea that we will be better if we lock everything. Well, and how well is that working, right? I mean, I think the, the argument is not that we are not going to continue to build borders. I mean, I, it, in terms of things being obsolete, you know, BlackBerry had its best years ever right after the iPhone was released. You know, so it takes a while for systems to catch up with what's going on, and especially at the complex level of, of, of countries and of cities. I mean, it... These are very short-term solutions where people are thinking about building walls that are going to be catastrophic globally, right? I mean, Trump wanting to build the wall on Mexico is, has been a big part of America abdicating its role in global leadership, according to like many people that are not that ideologically anti-Trump uh, in theory, right? So I think the, the rise of borders is like a false signal in terms of where we're headed uh, because things are going to get worse as we build more borders. Because it's not like those, like where are those refugees going to go, right? Where, um, and automation and climate change also are, are, they do not pay attention to borders. So we're going to see, you know, maybe maybe a, an individual country, a smaller country, like a Scandinavian country like Sweden, can, can do more to transition its labor economy uh, because of automation um, than, than a larger country like America. But overall, you know, nobody is going to be immune to these global forces. So the borders are going to create an artificial segmentation that's going to get in the way of solutions. And it could come really quickly. Uh, I agree with you on the fact that climate change has come very big on this stage uh, right now. And I'm as, I'm as sweaty as you are five minutes ago, so it's, it's going to be a nightmare within one hour. Well, it's sort of, we're, we're living out climate change, right? This is what it, we'll all look like soon. <laughs> Sonia, do, do, do you believe the same? Because, you know, uh, we, we're not at the end of, of, of all these walls. They're, they're, he's going to build, he's, he's really going to make the wall with Mexico, right? No, he, he can't, he's not, I mean, he, he's not very competent. Thankfully, so I don't. I'm not betting on it. Okay, uh, we we might have some also in Europe uh, after after the Brexit. Um, I, I know Brittany doesn't need wool because they have the sea, but more and more uh, countries and more and more cities uh, are, are questioning the fact that they could put walls or at least tax barrier in in the end. I think walls are, are inevitable and they are kind of, they're influenced by fear. Um, but when it comes to Europe, for example, there's no serious immigration policy frameworks or structures that are in place to help process the inflow of people, whether it be through, uh, whether it be immigrants or whether it be refugees. So I think that kind of culture of creating the system, um, system, system sorry, systemic way of, of controlling maybe people or maybe controlling is a strong work, but at least word, but at least managing people uh, could help reduce uh, the sense of fear um, that we're seeing, particularly with, with human migration. So I think that when it comes to the Canadian system, for example, we have a long history of, of managing people. We have our own ministry that's um, committed to immigration. We have these processes in place. So there's been some research now saying that um, people's comfort level with the amount of people coming in. So in Toronto, for example, 60% of us were born outside of the outside of the country and outside of the city. Um, and these numbers are on the rise, and we're we're accepting 1% of the Canadian population every the inflow of 1% of the population on an annual basis. So one of the things that we're seeing now is that people are are starting to come to Canada. Our Canada is in a bit of a spotlight, and our immigration policies and systems by no means perfect. Uh, but the the fact that that kind of system is in place makes people feel safer in terms of um, people, con yeah, controlling essentially the flow of people. And, and significantly, I think you're absolutely right. The fear is the biggest thing to be afraid of, right? Because people make terrible decisions when they're afraid. So even if the policies can look reasonable for the fear to go down, then rational discourse is more likely to take place, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it is no matter what we do, it's an essential first step to just make people not as panicky. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that they that 
people are going are discussing kind of the bureau bureaucratic process of it uh, of let's say inter integration belonging uh, immigration uh -huh. higher <laughs> I said a Frenchman's favorite word right <laughs> bureaucracy <laughs> just kidding yeah yeah did you hear that because the microphone was <laughs> was fine. Uh, so you perturb me. Um, there is a French writer uh, named Régis Debray uh, who, who made last year um, uh, a book uh, very much in favor of borders because he was claiming that borders are peace. When you have no borders, it means that you are in the state of war and crossing a border means that you, you know that you are not in your home and so that you have certain rules that you have to respect. Do you think, do you think it's, uh, it's an old man speaking? So in the U.S. right now, there's sort of a, a kind of a movement. It's mostly hypothetical, but there's some real meat to some of it around Cal Exit, right? So California, as a state, has is like the fifth largest economy in the world. It produces over half of America's food. Six, six, fifth is France. Oh, okay, we got knocked down. And it, and it's a it's a global economic engine, right? So it's got food, it's got military, it's got all of these things. So it would make a pretty decent country. But the, the reason why it's not going to happen is because do you think it would be more peaceful between America, the rest of America and California, if it was its own country, right? I mean, I think that this is, the, the issue is that it's fine to say that borders create peace, but where is the evidence of that? I think borders are the, the framework upon which we build the war narrative, right? I mean, America is, is much larger than any country can, should reasonably be, and so there's a lot of problems managing in that. But the reason why people aren't literally yet killing each other in the streets in great numbers. I mean, I have to hedge that because if you're black, they are. But for the, the cold civil war that exists in America would not be made easier by dividing up the states, giving them their own militaries, giving them their own governments, giving them their own sovereignty. Sovereignty is sort of, in some ways, I think of it as just, it's sort of as like an ego, right? And so if you have two egos matching, that's where war comes from. And if you start to dissolve that, it's a lot messier, but it's, it's a lot harder to justify a war narrative internally. So basically, when we listen to what you say, the main tension seems to be the big contradiction between uh, an economy that's more and more global. You, you, you mentioned uh, Uber and Airbnb, and we could claim tons of other that in within three or four years are present in over 100 countries. So basically, their identity is global; it's, it's worldwide. And the fact that we don't have trust uh, in the in the um, government, the bigger the governments are, the less we trust them. So we don't trust Europe. We trust a little bit more uh, in in the French, and then we trust even more in uh, into the um, the leaders of the cities. So, what? How do we make the this contradiction match? I mean, I, I kind of made my pitch for that here, but I would <laughs> be much more interested to hear what you think about that. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll jump in. <laughs> so, I like I said. So, and I I kind of had to speed through the conclusion, but I do think the difference between the idea of city states now. And the idea of when we had city-states in the past is that city-states in the past were much more siloed. They were much more isolated. It was very difficult to coordinate resources. So in the ramp-up, you got a lot of economies of scale over the coordination of, of centralizing and becoming larger, right? So there was a very practical reason to have centralized institutions, centralized governments. One of the fundamental characteristics of these new technologies is that you can get the same level of coordination by networking together, right? So this move from centralized to distributed is is like a world-changing move that is going to push on our governments and make our governments fail more and more to the degree that they don't uh, manage to like locally adapt things through networking. But it allows for things like local governments, which people trust, to share resources, share information, share data, to create kind of a global coherence. Because you know, if you think about like the UN, like all of our science fiction sort of has these global governments. The problem with the UN is the UN represents nobody, right? There's no individual person on the planet that the UN actually specifically represents. So it's it's this problem of sort of it's global in some ways, but it's actually just a bunch of people, right? And um, and not that many people. So if you can combine the the resilience and legitimacy of local governance with the global coherence of the the world's global cities, that actually creates a framework that has some legs to it. And so I think that's where we're going to see national governments fail. Probably the larger they are, the faster they fail. Like Singapore is already a city state. It's probably fine. France is pretty small. You can probably get through it. But um, countries, you know, overall in Europe, overall in America, I mean, this is going to be 
forced upon these national governments one way or the other. I think one of the hard issues, though, is that rural and urban divide, right? And how we're seeing that is really polarizing from what you had said in your presentation. Your likelihood of voting for Trump seemed to be based on, <clears throat> uh, seemed to be based on the population of where you're living. So I think that's interesting. And the fact that we're in this transition phase where we have in many different areas, they're like, you know, we're, we're, a lot of people have phones, but the access to it uh, can be tricky, you know, in terms of gender, you know, we're kind of on the route to this changing uh, gender identities and blah, blah, blah. When it comes to cities, we're seeing all these transitions. So I think we can't underestimate the, the, the amount of people that are disenfranchised and aren't connected to uh, to the city structures in, in the same way as we're talking about. So, you know, I, I would be a little bit worried as well if, if city or like the large cities became like the new, um, the new actual structures on a global, uh, on a global scale, because obviously there are these node cities and very, you know, powerful cities in many different ways, but what about all the surrounding areas? What about the rural areas? What about uh, agriculture and all the, these other elements? So I'm wondering where the place is for them in that larger larger picture, because I'm totally on board with what you're saying, but the more and more and more there seems to be the, the rural argument that's uh, that's emerging. Yeah, I have a quick on that. All right. sure. So I think it's absolutely right, and, and I think sort of what I'm advocating in the, in the, the forcefulness I'm advocating it for is particularly aimed at sort of Western economies. So thinking about in the U.S., one of the biggest sort of dynamics in the U.S. around the election was that people living in rural areas, not only did they vote for Trump, but they are vastly receiving subsidies from the government um, from the, the sort of the surplus that's being generated economically by the cities, yeah. right? So people in rural areas rely on cities but resent them for it. So you've got this really dysfunctional relationship. And I think that the kind of managed divorce of, of devolving back to the cities would create some honest feedback loops mm -hmm. at, at the very beginning where the where then the the interactions would become a lot more sort of in good faith potentially because rural areas don't recognize that they rely on cities. And so right now there's no discourse. Mm -hmm. So I think... It, I think it would be actually quite viable in America. I think rural areas would agree to be more self-governed at, in in, at first, and cities would be okay with it. And then, and then we would see the feedback loops from that, and then we would have discussions from there. But right now, people aren't even aware of what they're depending on, and so creating systems that, that make those relationships more explicit, I think, is, is kind of the, the, the direction. We'll come back. Uh, to the opposition between cities and uh, intercourse of the of the country, but during your presentation, you in the end you you presented uh, a very optimistic view of cities. Uh, you know they have the good side; they, they they get the job done. They're trusty by the citizens, and they they share and they work together within networks. And LA, New York, uh, Paris. Uh, isn't it like a little bit idealistic, like we're all friends? Because we know that there is a very tense uh, competition between the big cities to, to, to have the, the biggest companies that come, the biggest events, like uh, the Olympic Games, for instance. Sure. I mean, I think it's, it's easy to be sort of, you know, I, I mean, everything r uh, benefits from endless nuance on it. I think I'm relatively optimistic about cities because everything else is an unmitigated disaster, you know? So I think the progress is always going to be hard. I don't imagine anybody's holding hands in, in some kind of utopian future in any scenario. But in terms of the actual plausible scenarios where we don't destroy all ecological systems on the planet, right, or where we don't sort of end in kind of like endless civil wars at national levels, like that's, that for me, Optimism is that we don't eradicate ourselves. So I think that the, that the tensions and the fights and the spats are like worth the cost of that. And how do we deal with the, with the gap uh, between people from big cities and people from the, the deeper country? Because what you said, your card with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, we could have the same in France with Marine Le Pen and, and Macron, of course, like Everybody. Paris voted 96% for Macron. Was yeah. London didn't vote for Brexit, right? Yeah. yeah. So how do we deal with that? Well, so we, we talked do we, about do, do we take everyone in the city and we have drones and robots to product food? No, so it, it's sort of what I mentioned before that the rural areas resent the cities, but they rely on them, right? All of their economic activity, and and it's it's fair in some ways because rural areas are largely not participating in the changes in the global economy. So if you want to participate in the global economy, you kind of need to be in a, a mega city in order to do it, right? You need to if you're if you're living in a London or a Paris, you have access to these kind of global opportunities that have automated um, and and removed a lot of jobs. So. So, you know, rural areas kind of face three problems. So they have uh, these sort of agricultural traditional lifestyles that are no longer economically profitable because 
tomatoes coming from China are way cheaper than tomatoes you're going to produce here, which we talked about somewhat yesterday. Um, you also have the automation of other kinds of information jobs is 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 untethered from from rural areas. So it's it's not just that you live in a place that you have an, like a kind of relative opportunity or uh, advantage anymore, right? Because you know these jobs can often be done in the Philippines. They can be done anywhere. So rural areas don't necessarily benefit from that. They don't have the density to support the infrastructure. And climate change is hitting rural areas uh, disproportionately more. So it's making those traditional lifestyles harder. So. So over time, I mean, I think a lot of people like in Appalachia, in, which is a huge stronghold for Trump in the U.S., it's like coal country, right? That coal is also, it's not going to come back. That's not an industry. This, there's no viable path, really, for them. They're going to become like refugees at a certain point. I don't think anybody should force anybody to move. I don't, that's not a value that I have. But I think, again, we just need to make these, these relationships and dependencies more explicit. Cities could make a lot of progress that they could then help the rural areas with, that if we keep fighting between the cities and the rural areas, we're not going to make that progress. Climate change is going to hit us worse. We're all going to be worse off for not doing it. So in, in, the, in the short term, I think it's just a necessary strategy to move forward. In the longer term, I think the same benefits of platforms, and this is a longer conversation, because I live in a rural area. So part of my sort of like making this argument is I'm willing to live in a rural area if this happens. I live in a, in a part of Texas that is not that is, is outside of Austin, that where there's a lot of Trump voters, and my feeling is like the best work that I can do right now in America at the local level is live in a place with people that I disagree with and make local community with them. And so I'm trying to live that so that I can stand up here and say these things uh, with some integrity. Um, I think there are solutions for rural areas, but they're going to be vastly different than the solutions for urban areas. And so cities might as well start forging their own path because their needs are so different and much more global. Rural areas, their needs are going to be dramatic, but they're going to come from very different places. Um, if you allow me, I'll, um, we're going to have a gallop with the, with the stage because this year I, had a, um, I, w I was uh, uh, teaching a class uh, with students from like 20 countries uh, in political rhetoric, and uh, uh, we, we were speaking about Europe, you know, just after the Brexit, and I, I asked them who felt more European and who felt more from their own country. And actually, I was the only one to feel more French than European. They were all feeling very much European. So let's say we have like uh, let's let's allow the audience to have uh, four identity. Uh, you can either choose your city. You, you can say I'm Parisian, or or where where whatever city you come from. Uh, National, continental, or uh, other, you know? Global. Yeah, global. After, after all, the, the, the fifth religion in the world is Jedi, so you don't have to make a, a corporate, corporate <laughs> answer. So who feel more that his identity is built by the city he lives in? few people that's all right <laughs> that's all right we have about five who would say it's a, it's his country i i do play you ah we we have we have a we have rather a lot uh, -huh. uh and who feels comfortable with his continent okay a few okay a few and uh from what i can see more europeans uh and who feels more global Okay, so I think I think it's it's still the age of the country, right? Well, it, it is. So this is a, another part of the conversation. I don't think that that's contradictory at all to my premise because identity and state infrastructure do not need to be the same thing, right? We have the words nation and state. They come from very different etymologies. The nation of people that shares affiliation and culture does not need to be governed by the same government, right? So this is, I think, something where it's been the case because of the needs of optimizing for resources, but. You can have nations of people that do not necessarily share a country, right? Like refugees, right? Their identity might be where they came from, but they're scattered all over the world. That's going to become more increasingly the case. Um, and you can have nations of people that are sharing infrastructure between different places without where that infrastructure is adapted. So I don't think state governments should take that much solace from people having strong national identities. <laughs> what do you think of that highly scientific gallop that we just made? I think it's probably pretty accurate. <laughs> I was happy to see a lot of uh, global global people in the room. Sorry, microphone. But maybe the the the, the other uh, in in a global world, the, the the last part of the identity would be the language. Uh, this year, and I I think I saw a couple of them. 
Um, we are uh, hosting here in Paris um, a group of uh, activists from all over the world uh, in, a, in a program called Lab Citoyen, Citizen Lab. Are you here? And they, and they are loud. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and it's pretty uh, impressive, you know, to see all those kids, that, they're like really young, coming from all over the world. And uh, you have no problem having interaction for, with people who come from Bogota, uh, Mani, Philippines, or uh, Iraq, or Congo. As long as they, you know, they, they speak French, they made studies, and we kind of have a, a, a common identity. I, I sometimes felt closer from them than from a French guy who would vote Marine Le Pen. So, <laughs> and in, in a sense, I guess we would have the same language, but I'm not sure. I think that that experience that you just described is very unique to this particular time or this generation. Because I, I co-founded an organization called Youthful Cities, and we were active in 75 cities around the world with young people. And I was always, doesn't matter that necessarily that, that, that they were young, but I was really surprised that we were able to like boost this global movement of people with this that shared similar values and felt connected regardless of where they were. And then we're talking, you know, in Kinshasa, or you know, in in Lagos, but also in you know Paris um, or New York. So I thought that was fascinating. And I think that's very unique to our to our time, and really opens up collaboration like like never before. Mm -hmm. Not that I really want to use that word, but <laughs> um, friendship. Oh, you can. And is there in in there anything that you would uh, like to keep since since you? Both of you raised the, your hands with the global stuff. There is no, really nothing yet you want to keep from your local identity, like, I don't know, like food, for instance. Because we're all global. You, you can eat food from all over the world when you're in Paris. But, you know, we are very proud of our wine, cheese, and meat, and blah, blah, blah. No? Well, yeah. I mean, I didn't want to undermine the poll when it was first happening. But I think to, to have a, the idea of a binary identity is really false, right? I mean, everybody's identities are incredibly layered, right? So you, even within, you know, sort of a, a national identity, you have the identity of your ethnic origins and wherever you came from, right? So people who are living in France will have a French identity. But if you came from somewhere else, then might, you might have part of that African or the, the German identity that you bring with you. Everybody has an identity within their family, within their company. They do have identities within in the city. So I think that identity needs to be thought of something that touches everything that we do, not as something that's a driver really of anything, other than when it's used as a political wedge by national governments, right? I think the, the, the polarization is a propaganda technique more than something that people are actually naturally inclined towards. I would, I would be in favor of that. I, I told you just before that this panel that the last time that we had a ministry of identity in France, it, it wasn't a, a, a great memory for French people and French electors. Do, do we have microphone for the audience? Yes, we do. Great. Do we have any questions? Of course we do. Right in the middle. You can start by saying what identity you feel like. When it comes to food, i Thank you. Um, my name is Bernardo. And I just wanted to start my point uh, bringing up what, what maybe your last point about uh, this uh, false duality between uh, your identity that is not like fixed on you're either one thing or another. There are people who might feel uh, more identified with their religion than with their nation states or with their soccer, uh, their football teams uh, than anything else. Um, so if, if, if we do this methodology in which you have to be, I would uh, maybe raise the hands for all the four uh, categories. If I'm from Rio de Janeiro, if I'm talking from someone uh, from Sao Paulo, of course I will be very, very, uh, feel very more uh, from my city uh, as a carioca than from uh, Sao Paulo, but we will both be Brazilians and so on and so on. Uh, and that brings to another point about the meaning, the like more philosophical meaning of what identity is, and it's basically uh, what makes you feel uh, more connected to someone or more unlike uh, the other. Mm -hmm. And bringing this point to the other, we were talking before about walls, uh, outside, maybe outside cities, but I would like to raise the point about walls within cities. We've been looking at the, we've been talking today about the uh, urban uh, element or the urban scale at a global scale as a unit, uh, but I want to bring the discussion uh, inwards of the city because mm -hmm. it, it, it's not homogenic. Uh, even uh, sure. maybe uh, most of the cities voted for Trump, uh, in New York, maybe you had like a very right-wing uh, candidate. Uh, maybe Bloomberg was the mayor before. And now we have a socialist. Uh, they have a socialist uh, mayor, which is the Blasio. So we still have uh, some divides, which are um, 
um, reflected upon electoral politics, which is, of course shouldn't be taken for granted as what, how, how power is uh, negotiated, right? Um, but I think the main issue that I want to bring is how walls are actually dividing uh, us as identity, whichever it is, from the other within the city. So this otherness and this uh, interiorization of uh, a war logistics that is not uh, necessarily over at the global scale, at the national level, but within this mil militarization of the public spaces uh, by local authorities and this divide. Hello, this divide, and I just wanted to finish uh, with the verse from a band from Rio called Ohapa uh, that says, um, at some point of one of their most famous songs, uh, the walls of the gated communities are supposed to bring protections, but they also bring the doubt whether if, if it's them that they're living within the prison. Uh, so I just wanted to bring the, the question to the uh, in, inwards, the urban le level. Thank you very much. Um, who want to who answer that point? I mean, so, so I think it's it's a it's a very good point, and I think it's, I'm glad you contributed to that. Thank you. I I think the areas where cities agree isn't necessarily on local politics, it, but it is meaningfully on the global politics, right? So you can get a lot more agreement on what to do about climate change within cities um, than you can across cities and rural areas. So I think, ironically, what we're going to need to do is shift like what we're actually trying to do away from what it seems like the identity group is in recognition of how multi-layered these are. So, and one of the tools we have to do that is that sort of in, in terms of identity as a state I identity, right? It's something that we use to actually track our systems and, and to scale them up. One of the benefits we have now is that we can hold much more complex identities in those systems than we ever could before. So for most of the modern world, we've had just a few pieces of identity, right? Like in the US, you have a social security number, you have a driver's license, you have a passport, maybe. Uh, and those things have like you know a dozen bits of information about you, and they, they demand that you say you're man or woman, they demand you have a name, they have all these things. Um, and uh, it, with Facebook, you know, so Facebook is something that people globally have access to, and they had this issue where there was a lot of demand to have more gender options, right? So a few years ago, they opened it up and they, they canvassed and they said, okay, instead of just man and woman, here's 49 gender options. And then they got more pushback and they were like, okay, here's a text field, put in your gender. And the, the point of that is that that, whatever nuanced, complex gender identity that somebody wants to identify for themselves can be, can be proliferated and spread all around the world through the Facebook API in a way that allows that complexity and that nuance to scale in a way that it couldn't before. So I think we have a lot more opportunities and fewer constraints to, to make identities more complex. Um, so, that, so that's one part of it. But I, I think to your other point about cities, I don't anticipate that the politics within cities are necessarily going to get easier. But I think that, again, they're, they're going to be less disastrous than the current sort of stalemate of politics that we see at the, the national level. So I think those the benefit of cities is that you can create meaningful programs that get people face to face, which is sort of provably the best way to increase empathy and, and get people working together. That can, that can be coordinated at the local level in a way that at the national level, it's just impossible, right? Sure. Um, Ole Kinnaman from, I feel, uh, identif I would firstly identify as European, but I have uh, first a comment talking about post-Brexit without having someone from the United King Kingdom on the panel feels like really wrong. Um, I mean, if we want to talk post-Brexit, we should have someone here be from England because we should always... The Queen is our head of state. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, we should always try to talk with people and not about people. So, I mean, if we talk about Brexit, we should talk about with the English. Um, I had um, two points where I disagreed with, with Dylan in his presentation, or where I thought something is, I feel differently. When you said in, in a discussion that uh, you talked about the Western economy, I think in Europe, the perception of identifying as being part of the West is dying, if it's not with some people already dead. And then Trump is pushing that further, but people don't feel as the same like Western group, like being the same culture and identity with the US. So my question to you would be, do you really identify as, as Western? Oh, sorry. And um, the second point is, I think our identity also uh, influences our perception of the world and who do we see and how do we see them. And if the further you, someone else feels like away from your identity, the less you see them. So I, I wonder, like when you had the ride sharing slide, you didn't have DD. And DD, one against Uber in China, it's just bigger. And uh, looking at solar, for example, solar, you had a huge solar industry in Germany and it's dead because Chinese industry is so much bigger. 
we might see that same with the sharing industry. We have the first bike sharing company moving to Manchester from, from China. Um, so just I, I wanted to bring that idea, what you think of that, that sometimes we have a huge changes, for example, in China, but we don't see them because we can't identify with them. It's too far away from our identity and our perception. Yeah, Okay, so I'll start with the second one. So, um, I mean, the, the slide that I pulled was just a slide that I pulled. It was just sort of meant to be representative of many ride-sharing services. You're right, DD, I mean, it also had the support of the Chinese government, and uh, they've had a lot of advantages in coordinating their platform services. So millions of people in China are using WeChat to do everything from, like, not just using it like an Uber and Airbnb alternative, but using it to pay for things, using it to interact with their doctor. So they're, they're much further ahead than we are. Um, but I think you're, with the second point, you're essentially making the argument for the Internet of Cities as well, in the sense that uh, if those platforms were owned locally, that they would feel less alien. So to the degree that cities together collectively could start to could engage in, in demanding, in some ways, the so certain social contracts that fit the identity of that area, Right? That that would be the requirement. That's what happened in Austin, was they said, we have a different social contract that we want to enforce with this platform, and you can meet it or not. So it's, it's not a matter of necessarily who's providing the service, but saying, what does this service do? Because the service isn't, it, it's, it's a, it, like I say, it's a commodity. It's kind of, it's culturally um, adaptable to, to some degree, and it's culturally sort of separated already from, like, there's no such thing really as, like, British Uber versus, like, American Uber or something, right? Um, other than in French Uber, people smoke in the cars I've noticed, uh, but um, so that you know you can adapt locally. But I think you're right that if we what, what you're describing is what will happen if we don't pursue something like what I'm saying, which is that you're going to see multinationals and countries that look like multinationals. So China operates more and more like a multinational, and that's part of how they're able to succeed in this modern economy because they can create services that then can then become um, sort of distributed everywhere, right? So DD isn't a part of the Chinese government, but they're very tightly coordinated. So that, that gives them sort of that internal ability to, to win um, and then the ability to also have the scale to spread. Uh, in terms of the first question, um, which was a while ago now, so I'm trying to remember it. Oh, so the West. So, so part of it is language is hard, and I only had a certain amount of time, so everything's reductive, right? Um, when I talk about the West in that way, I mean it specifically in terms of sort of the economic story of these areas. So the post-industrial world that is now kind of on, you know, that, ha that shares characteristics in the sense of that these are the places that are currently generating the lion's share of the world GDP. They've defined culturally what the economic models look like. Uh, and they're producing fewer children, by and large, and they are declining economically, potentially, as well. So for these kinds of like declining former powers, um, and you know, declining is a strong word, they don't have to all decline, but their situation is very different than like sort of the, the non-West or the emerging economies that we're seeing in places like uh, Brazil and China and India and Nigeria and these places where people are, the, there's middle classes being created for the first time, right, as opposed to middle classes that we're trying to maintain. So I think the story of how you, what you do with an existing middle class that's being hollowed out by automation and, and global outsourcing is necessarily very different than the story for places that are still emerging, that are still identifying sort of social contracts that are more inclusive, uh, where, where devolving power to the city is probably not going to help women's rights uh, faster, right? So I would, I'd be very careful to not s to say that I think this is a good solution for Rwanda necessarily or Nigeria, um, where where it's still there's still you know there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of movement, and then there's a lot of of work that that is being done internally in terms of of, of basic human rights, as opposed to places where it's it's been maybe a little bit more relatively comfortable and there's been more economic advantages that are are being diluted. Could we could we pass the mic? to uh, Mathieu Potbonneville, who's somewhere here, and who was surprised that no one identified himself as a worker as an identity, and that, that's, that's really a philosopher idea. I say that because he's a philosopher. I don't know if it's a philosopher idea, but I, I was wondering, that I was remembering that in other times, uh, people could have said that uh, instead of identifying yourself as a citizen of a city or a country, you could identify yourself as a, uh, um, as a worker. Uh, and uh, I was wondering why those uh, socio-economical uh, uh, definitions and identities, uh, uh, how can they be, can they have disappeared uh, so much, so completely? 
from those kind of debates. I think that political identity has completely replaced the problem of uh, 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 economical identity. And I think that it's not so easy to play with so social economical identities than with uh, political identities. Not so easy to redefine or com combine those identities. Uh, well, that was the, uh, the Marxist uh, statement of the, the day. Any comment? Because you seem to agree. You like, you like to comment on this yeah, of course I liked it. I, I think. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to comment, Dad? Please. No, you. No, I was just going to say that there's. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting comment. Not <clears throat> an <clears throat> uh, aside from a philosophical, uh, just a comment on that comment, it is interesting that we usually identify most with what we do. So it is interesting that that didn't come up, right? Because we're so clo closely identified identified with the work that we do and what that represents. I think particularly now with this whole kind of like purpose-driven economies and a lot of the work that people probably in this room are doing. So it, it's a fascinating aspect that we didn't focus on the that side of it, but rather the, the definition of borders and identity and what that means. It can, well, maybe it's my fault, but maybe also it's also a good news that means that we've, we've, uh, we've gone beyond the stage of uh, just being workers. I know that Arthur de Grave, who's here somewhere, was but here yesterday uh, at a tribunal here in the WeShare, and he was the, the lawyer for the cause of laziness. And should we uh, write down laziness into the constitution? I think you won. So it's, it's, it's a great cause. We, we don't have to be workers, moreover. So great. I have a comment on that. So I do think that there's a, there's a part of it that's also, as we create more and more kinds of work identities, it becomes more difficult to identify with that work. So there's a big generational shift where people are no longer, you know, a hundred years ago, the mythology of any given country had like a, a manageable number of occupations in it. Like either you're, you're like a baker or a doctor or a lawyer or a king, right? And so, I mean, that's an oversimplification, but there was an element of that where you could really have an identity around that. And if you were a journalist, like we all can picture what a journalist looks like, how they dress, how they talk, how you interact with them. But today's generation, for one, people are hopping jobs and those jobs are disappearing. But like the, the worker identity created around like a social media consultant is not particularly strong, right? So I think it's also that there's that as we can rely less on our work streams as being a foundation to build our identity, that we've moved it to other places. I mean, I think I, I would maybe argue philosophically that identity is more of a process uh, than, than something that we own because it's an adaptation strategy. So we will form an identity around the things that we think are more or less solid, and then we will separate our identity from the things that are not. And so work has become less solid. Uh, other things have become less solid. Um, and, and so our identities end up sort of shifting around and the more they shift around, they allow you to kind of create maybe like a meta identity. Like I think global is too easy of an answer for my identity. It's much more like our, our participant said, if, who, depends who I'm talking to. My identity is relative to the context of the, the situation. And so again, it, it can't be a driver of anything. It, we just need systems that can manage the complexity of it. Any social media manager who want to react? No, here, yeah. A couple of questions. Where's the mic? Social media manager, okay. And we have a couple of questions. You're doing a great job. Revenge. Yes. <laughs> um, when I heard, yes, can you? Okay, thank you. Um, when I read this panel, I was really interested in, because I do work also um, in questions about, about identity. And when you say understanding identity in a post Brexit Europe, we have to understand first what Brexit and what Trump, in the general context, did to identity. So you were saying that identity, yeah, it's, thank you, <laughs> it's, it's a construction, and you know, we all before it was work, religion, you know, skin color, place of birth. And the problem, I think, it's Brexit and nationalism in general has what it made identity mean and basically politicized it. And it made some identities evil and ungood and the whole fear that we were talking about, right? So which identities you have to fear, which is us, which is them, and how we protect. And this is like the rise of new borders. So I think it's more about how we, identity is not, you know, it's not normative, but if we, are able to save what identity means, we have to understand how it works and how nationalism has instrumentalized that one and politicized it. I totally agree. There's a, there's a great book that I recommend everybody read by this author, Yuval Noah Harari, called Sapiens. Um, I think they were selling it, we share here. Yeah. And, and his central premise, it's sort of, it's one of these long history books about the history of the human race. And his central premise is that everything humans have done is create shared fictions upon which we've then acted, right? So that's our superpower over monkeys, is the ability to create and, and disseminate fictions. And so nationality is a fiction, religion is a fiction, right? All of these things are stories in our head. And 
in the identity process, if we can make the nation fiction strong enough, it, that's what initially pulled us out of tribalism, right? Was that we created these larger group identities um, from sort of the family to the tribe to the religion to sort of the economic national unit. And now as the national unit is flakier, I think part of what's happening is that people are, are falling back on the most stable thing they can think of, which is like, oh, I'm white. Okay, that's my identity now, right? So it's, it's the sort of return to tribalism, I think, is representative of these other fictions being unstable. And so if we, to the degree we can create new, more stable fictions, identity will probably naturally gravitate there. But in the meantime, I think it's also, it's just sort of... Um, fodder for propaganda tactics, right? I mean, it's like the media environment and the propaganda environment in the new world, I really do think is what's allowed, you know, people can be targeted and then have their tribal characteristics identified and, and juiced and then people believe whatever they want to believe because they can create their own news source that meets that, right? So it's not, I, I think it's a, it's a symptom of the nature of the transition we're in, not like that all, all of a sudden human beings are like, have less empathy or something, you know? No more question there? Uh, mine was less of a question, but as someone who is from very rural England, I did just want to input basically to the point that you were just saying that when I've spoken to people in the countryside who were all very kind of staunch Leave voters, one of the things that came through consistently is, is a kind of rebelling against this exact idea and the idea of moving towards a European identity or a global identity was one of the key reasons why they actually wanted to leave uh, the European Union and um, that that again I think it parallels with the conversation you had before about the urban versus rural I think that they have uh, such a more kind of ingrained idea of their agricultural identity and who they are and, and if you live in a city and you live in a cosmopolitan uh, scenario then you're a lot more open to that diversity and I think that it's just interesting that this conversation of uh, your identity and post Brexit is, is kind of one of the key drivers for, for why I think it happened. Yeah, at least a characteristic of it, right? I mean, I think because people didn't also understand what Brexit was about, right? That was like what came out in the news after is like these, everybody's Googling like what is Brexit um, after they had voted for it. And so it is it is it is sort of a, a drive on people's uncertainty and their fear. And then, yeah, I think that, that local identity becomes something that feels more secure and comforting that you can ride on. The difficulty is going to be that that identity isn't just being attacked from the outside. It's also just like not viable anymore, right? Agricultural identities as a lifestyle are, are different difficult, much more difficult than they've ever been, and they're going to get more difficult. So there's also this sort of existential, I think a big part of it is also men have been used to having unquestioned patriarchal access to everything, and that's changing, that's a really positive change, and so you see a lot of men freaking out because they were raised to be in control of things and, and not to be able to listen, you know, and so I think a lot of this will have to get sorted out generationally, I think, as as we figure out, like, how, what, is the, what is the archetype of being a man without that being, like, uh, sort of just driving towards toxic masculinity. There was one behind? Yeah. Um, um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Um, personally, uh, I see, I, I think identity um, is affected by the language you speak. We, uh, uh, for me, who has a Nigerian father and a British mother, language has always been part of it. Like, oh, I'm, I'm back at home because of, of the British side. I'm, I'm not viewed as Nigerian. When I came into uh, to France and I, I was viewed as African, when I went to Spain mm -hmm. and spoke Chinese because I'd been to China, I was viewed as French in China because I was with the French people. And in my class in China, because in, in Spain, because I spoke Chinese and I was learning uh, Spanish, I was viewed as Chinese. So it really depends on language. Language really affects your identity. Now, but my, my question now is, um, with um, this kind of negative view on global powers, such as the UN and the nation state, what is the future of the nation state uh, in our world today? Where you see, where now we're talking about like the uh, Europe, has, um, the UK has left Brexit. Um, countries are segregating little by little, and now we ex we since we see that probably the nation or the state, the country cannot provide the needs we we we, uh, we as citizens want. We are being advised to do it on our own because we can't always look to the government for solutions. Now, if this happens, what is the role of nation states in the future? And uh, does this mean that will this lead to a more segregated world since people are going to identify as their own little pockets of what like providing the services they need 
oh, like you look at North and South Sudan, they looked at, um, they looked and saw that their country was no longer sustainable because the South felt that they, the North was no longer representing them. You look at Barcelona and you look at and, um, uh, uh, Catalonia and the rest of Spain, and they feel that Spain doesn't recognize them. You, there are so many instances where you see um, people fighting for certain rights, and if they fight for these rights and get them, does this mean that a nation no longer represents them? Should they break away? And will this lead to more segregation in the world? There, there, there a question uh, here on the extreme left afterwards, please. Yeah, that's a great point. I think you're absolutely right. Language is a huge determinant of, of identity. Um, my, my wife is Mexican, so she, in our house, we speak Spanish and English. And um, I, and I see that, yeah, that it, it creates this natural cultural glue as well. Um, one of the really great things about this kind of well, let, let me start with a different point, which is I think in our previous vision of sort of global citizenship, right, the one we've been operating with through the 90s and maybe is still popular now, is this idea that somehow we're eventually going to arrive at some kind of one homogenous culture, which is like such a, a terrible idea, right? And so that, that, that's been a, a problem of our own mythology for a long time of progress, which is this idea that either all conservatives are going to become liberal or if you're conservative that all the liberals are going to like go away or that everybody's going to speak the same language. I mean, these are all very oppressive ideas. I think what's much more reasonable is to find systems that globally can coordinate on important issues like climate change, but that allow for like hyper-local customization, even at the level of like subcultural groups within places, so that individual cultures and languages and groups can survive and thrive and can use the same systems. Um, so that or, or adapt those systems to their need or create new systems, right? But that they can coordinate at the scale that's important, which is in terms of like resource use and, and, and resource flows and things like this. And, and it's very doable, right? I mean, Uber is not held back by different languages because you can adapt these things very easily. And we're, we're getting um, much more better tools. You know, Microsoft just released a tool that in real time you can speak and it'll translate immediately, right? So the ability to have collaboration and meaningful coordination between groups of people, even when they're speaking different languages, feels much more positive to me than the idea that, like, oh, you need to learn English in order to be a functional person. Um, uh, and so uh, I lost the thread. I'll, I'll stop there. I also want to say that the sense of belonging is a huge issue. So regardless of the, the borders of the nation state, or let's say you're from the city or you're from, from the rural area, I think that, that being having a sense of uh, belonging to whatever is being represented it and not othering, I think, is, is a huge aspect as well. So I think that, and it can fluctuate. Oh, sorry, I remembered. So to the, last, the second part of her question on the, the future of the nation state. So I, I personally believe that the nation state is the wrong size of a system in order to, to match the, the global and the local, right? That was my argument. I think that I read an article recently about sort of shopping for the right-sized country. And I think that there's like a good point to that, which is that if you, if you have a, a government and a state that matches the sort of regional characteristics of who it's governing, then there's going to be more legitimacy there. To the degree that you don't, you won't. So if we can create governmental systems that can adapt to multicultural uh, sort of patterns without creating really burdensome silos of like totally different economies, um, which exists already accidentally now, then those governments will succeed. And I think smaller countries are going to be better at doing that. But I think the future of the nation state is, uh, I think we're going to see the rise of some city powers and cities looking a little more like nation states in some cases. But there's going to be this sort of diffusion of power, um, ideally. I mean, we're going to have just endless war and strife until this happens. But a diffusion of power will, will be what the solution looks like in some way, where you're probably going to have a lot more countries uh, or states that are coordinating together, uh, but also maintaining sort of local cultural differences. Just listening to her question, uh, when we are questioning the utility of Europe and we have huge difficulties just finding like one good point, we always come back to this single but very strong argument, peace. Uh, because of the European construction, we didn't fight with the German for the first time in history for over 70 years. Don't, don't you fear that uh, we, we live in a very peaceful era, period. Uh, we, we have uh, problems looking at that because we see horror co coming on the internet every day but if you look we have we have very few war and and uh, nations are also, also a reason of that don't you fear that the the fact that we have tons of uh, small cities would lead to a big war like a like a game of thrones war <laughs> i don't think there's a huge advantage to trying to 
like, well, what is the utility of war in, in the current era, right? At, at a certain point, it was about trying to, like, own land and, and make wealth for yourself. But now you can do that without fighting people, right? Capitalism has kind of replaced war because you can just suck all of the economic value out of a place without having to actually attack its people. You just get them to drive, like, Uber for you instead, right? And so um, I think that part of it is, like, the war is just not as useful as a tool for gaining power anymore. And so a lot of that economic violence just happens at a different level is part of it. I don't think necessarily that cities going together would would create more opportunity for war because you'd have more pressure, right? Part of also what keeps Europe safe is that, like, if one country acts out, there's a bunch of other countries that will collectively put pressure on it to, to behave. And America doesn't have that. Canada and Mexico don't have a lot of leverage on America. If they were bigger and more powerful, they probably would. And if America was divided up into more, American sort of uh, international adventurism would probably be a little more restrained. Good answer. Hi. On the left. Hi, I'm Elena. Um, I'm living in London. I'm Italian. Uh, I lived all the Brexit situations as a foreigner in London and, and working in, in, in institutions that are talking for about Brexit. Um, I'm very pleased that the girl from, the, from England talked. Um, from my pers personal perspective, um, I think like identity in this case in, used as a, uh, in, in the Brexit situation is, uh, is kind of a um, has been like uh, identified like a oh. yeah, you're good. yeah it works yeah. okay so um, it's been used like a uh, kind of oh yeah so I'm here to protest so identity identity is used more like a like a viable for like to protest against something that we are not uh, any more uh, convinced of. Um, this means not just like a rural versus big cities, but like uh, citizens that are tired of uh, false promises from politicians that are not uh, really clear and transparent what they say, but just saying, because I have the vote rights, now I become British, or now I become uh, French, now I become Italian. So um, my question is like, when we uh, ask, our, when you ask ourselves how to identify uh, ourselves as a European, French, or whatever, can we just specify what uh, it, it identity in this sense is? Um, because I mean, identity as a, I'm Italian doesn't mean much. It means like a, I'm a I'm a person that cares about my city, so I want to protest about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a really good point you make there is that it's a form of protest, right? People, when they're voting for Trump, they don't, they're not voting for, they're voting for the idea of saying no to whatever's going on. And the reason they're doing that, I think identity is the rationale for it, but I think the driver is because their economic situation has worsened. So their lives feel harder than they did before, and they don't know why. The situation is incredibly complex. Somebody comes along and says, here's why. And even if that answer is completely wrong, it makes a lot more sense than whatever they've been told otherwise or what they've experienced. So the, the way to improve it wouldn't be to try to solve it through identity, but just improve their economic situation, and then they won't be so, they, the, the protest will die down, right? Yeah, I think there's there's a sort of disproportionate use of propaganda tactics being used in a lot of these things, right? Where it's much easier to drive hatred towards a, a sort of a cultural identity that's like a very easy story, as opposed to like embracing like increasing levels of complexity is hard. It's exhausting, right? So people understandably don't want to do it, and we we need to make it easier for people to do it. We're gonna take a, a last one at the first word before we 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 die of heat. <laughs> um. I wanted to congratulate you. It's been an incredible panel. I just wanted to comment on something. I am originally from Nicaragua, and I live in Mexico City. And um, in this this theme or, th or this question about identity, I think that we are kind of importing from the old generation this black and white way of thinking um, in, in this line of, of, of thinking of are you this, you're boxing everything. Are you pro-Brexit or are you against Brexit? Are you pro-Trump or are you anti-Trump? Are you this or are you that? You're forcing uh, people and people's ideas into specific boxes. And I think we're importing this line 
or this type of discourse from previous generations and we really should rethink the way we're, we're talking and the way we are asking people to box themselves and, and, and the way we are being asked to be boxed all the time. You know, you're, you're never able to say, I agree with Trump in one thing, I agree, I don't agree in another, or I, you know, this is this black and white dichotomy that, you know, comes from ages and, and we're not letting it go. And I think we should set an example of doing that. I, I 100% agree. I think that's something that's actually come out of a lot of our research. A couple of years ago, we were researching sort of Gen Z and generational shifts and as a part of looking at sort of future possibilities. And one of the most striking things that came out of our ethnography and survey work from that was that millennials and Gen Z are much more inclined in many areas to think of things as a spectrum than a binary, right? So gender is sort of a leading edge of that, that a majority of, of the millennials and, and Gen Z that we interviewed, and particularly Gen Z, like the really young people, saw gender more as a spectrum than a binary. And I think that you're exactly right. There's sort of a, a mismatch of how we categorize things, partly based on how we interact with information, right? And then the value shift that accompanies that. And that generationally, these kinds of conversations are going to, to shift because of that. But that we, pr we probably have to kind of ride it out until then, because it's a, a huge shift to say, you know, you have this strong, like you are a man, and that meant everything, as opposed to like, well, you know, and, and people accuse millennials of being kind of wishy-washy and flaky, but it's really, I think there's, there's a cultural adaptation that's happening at a generational level uh, where people are adapting to the complexity better. So now, did we solve your identity crisis during this hour? What would be your last word about your identity? <laughs> Hasn't changed. <laughs> Hasn't changed. Okay, so thank you all for uh, playing the game. Uh, the, the biggest identity within 30 years uh, in terms of uh, size of uh, writing is Catholic. But uh, otherwise from that we have... That's how they win. Yeah, we have very different uh, options. Martian, uh, anarchist, feminist. Uh, many of you hope that they will still be alive uh, within 30 years. That's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, some Brazilian must be here because they write for Temer, which means that the cor corrupted president has to get out. Um, we have international, Latino, uh, pacifist, Living humanist, and global human. So if you wanna, if you wanna carry on, we, we're gonna leave the paperboard just over here. Uh, I would like that you make a very warm. Uh, welcome to the uh, big support to the translator because we spoke very fast. Apologies for speaking so fast. And of course to the two panelists. Um, so we're going to go outside, enjoy fresh air and try and, uh, and read uh, Zygmunt Bauman, who, who's the, the philosopher that, uh, you know, theorized uh, the, the, the modern liquidity. And uh, we're going to uh, have uh, personal questions for Dylan about the 49 types of gender that you have, because I'm, I'm rather lost there and lost in translation. Thank you all. Thank you all.